Welcome back to our Bible study. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, O Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Jerome, pray for us. Holy Prophet Moses, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, welcome back. This is our second Bible study on Genesis. So last time we covered a few things, a few basic things. The authorship, we covered the idea of uh, is it feasible to believe that multiple sources compile this? We saw that, no, we cannot hold that. Uh, we also saw that um, what we're supposed to hold about the literal historical sense, and I encourage you to look at that introduction that we had before if you want to take a little review of that. And now we are going to get into the structure of the chapter itself, and we're going to get into Genesis chapter 1. So let's, let's dive in. Now in Genesis, uh, we recall it uh, begins with the word Bereshit, which is the very first word, just like in Catholic custom, we begin an encyclical with a certain word like humane vitae. Those are the first two words of that encyclical. And so that encyclical takes the name of, uh, of those first two words. So likewise, this is how it is in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, the Masoretic text. So the first word is bereshit, which means in the beginning. So uh, this is how we uh, begin the uh, chapter, so let's delve right into it. We saw this last week. Let's take a look once again. It begins with these words, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve et haaretz, ve haaretz hayeta tohu vavohu, ve hoshech al pene tehom, ve Verua Elohim merehefet al pene chamaim. Vayomer Elohim yehi or vayehi or. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved over the waters, and the Lord said, Let there be light, and there was light. And so the, the uh, gospel begins, and you're going to see in these days of creation seven basic themes that we're going to look at. We're going to see, uh, we're going to see uh, creation itself. Uh, we see division. We also see appellation, or that is naming something. And then uh, we also are going to see a couple of other themes. So let's take a look uh, a little more closely at the different themes in the first chapter Genesis. So first there is creation. Obviously we know that's the theme there. That's the whole book. Then we see division. So we're going to see moments where God divides. He divides the waters from the waters above, the waters below. We see he divides the water from the land. We see there is a division made between light and darkness. So we're going to see that in this chapter. Then appellation. Okay, naming things, things are named this or that. Provision. It's another thing we're going to see here is provision. God uh, provides things or fills these things. Uh, as we saw, uh, God, when he created the, the earth, it was tohu vavohu, which is formless and void. So God is going to establish form, and then he's going to fill that form, the, the voidness of that form, he's going to uh, fill out. So that's provision. He's going to provide things. Then we also see intention, because God will put intention into things. We will see this about the stars. Let them be for signs and for seasons. So there's an intention in there that God will manifest as each day has its proper act of creation. Intention. Then we have observation. 
So observation is this fact, this repeated curious statement that God saw that it was good and God saw the light. He separated it from the darkness. It's interesting that observation is a part of it. And then finally we have benediction. God will bless uh, the animals. He will bless uh, uh, the man once he is uh, created. So these are the basic seven themes. Uh, just a little more, more clearly so we see what we're talking about. Creation, we mean creation from nothing. Okay, so this is not simply taking matter, existent, pre-existent matter, and forming it. He's creating the matter. Uh, this is one thing that you will see in, in the difference between other creation accounts from different myths, from different cultures. They will often begin with stuff. This is unique to Judaism that they begin ex nihilo, creatio ex nihilo, creation from nothing. Because God indeed uh, created the very first matter, the prime matter from which he formed all the things. Then we have uh, division, separation. Appellation, simply a fancy name for naming. Then there is provision, or we could say adorning, adorning the different areas that God creates. And then we see God giving purpose to each thing. He, gives, he states intention, especially when something has an important purpose, he states the intention of that. Then we see the observation. God saw that it was good. And then finally, a blessing, a, a benediction. Okay, so those are the, the themes, the seven themes that we're going to see in varying degrees in each of the days. They don't have all seven each day, but we'll see uh, sort of a, a shift. Uh, you know, there's, certain, there's a division at the beginning, and then later on we see that provision and whatnot. So let's take a look at each day a little more closely. We'll, we'll take sort of a more general look at each of the days of creation, uh, and then we will... Um, you know, just kind of hit some of the major highlights of each day, and then we'll talk about well, what do we mean by this whole idea of day to begin with. Uh, so we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, so let's let's delve in. And by the way, uh, since uh, we we are up on uh, census fidelium uh, tonight, I think they're out of uh, jail, as it were. Uh, so we can uh, take questions there, um, also um, on our Facebook page. Um, so if you have any uh, questions to submit, you can submit those there, and then I will. Uh, Take those at the end of the class. Okay. So day one. On day one, there's first division. We're going to see later on. In fact, the first three days, there's acts of division, separating out. And then on the last three days, we're going to see acts of provision, God providing or filling. So in day one, there's a separation of the heavens and the earth. We recall how this whole chapter begins, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was, f was void and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit moved over the waters. So now it's interesting because in the Hebrew it says alpene tehom, which is the face of the deep, and then there's alpene hamayim, which is on the face of the waters. So you have this two, this contrast where Darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit was on the face of the waters. It's kind of interesting, this the Spirit versus darkness. So already, even before let light be made is stated, there's already this distinction. Darkness on the face of the deep, and the Spirit moved over the water. So even the, the English doesn't quite capture it, but it uses the same expression, alpene, which is on the face of, or over, okay, the waters. And God said, be light made, and light was made. Uh, now, when we say be light made in, in English, that's one. That's the way the Douay Rheims renders it. Uh, or let there be light, you hear it stated that way. Um, it's not like let there as in, you know, a, a permission or whatnot, or as though maybe he was restraining something that was trying to be there. It's really, and especially as you, as you see it in the, in the Hebrew, uh, he simply says, it's like it says, be light, light is. That's how it's sort of phrased in the Hebrew. You know. um, uh, yehi or, vayehi or, be light, and light is. 
So, you know, it's, it's not even in the past tense, as it were. So it's just interesting that uh, it's just, you know, let light exist or, you know, may light exist and it exists, simply that. So it's, it's really succinctly stated in the Hebrew and maybe not quite as well captured in the English, but that's just the way uh, translations work. So now I want to mention about this, uh, the Spirit of God moved over the waters. Merehefet is the Hebrew word. Merehefet is the word for like a bird brooding over something. I don't mean brooding as in like in English you're a brood, you know, you're, you're, you're angry over something. That, not that kind of brooding, the, the kind that, you know, a hen would brood over its young, uh, or hovering over, moving over. In the Latin, in the Vulgate, it is ferebatur, which is uh, moved over or really was carried over, ferebatur. But uh, the, the Hebrew has this, this idea of um, sort of, uh, you know, hovering over, watching over, brooding over uh, the waters uh, because there's about to be life there. And uh, this is a foreshadow, of course, of what's coming in baptism. Now, can you see the Holy Trinity in this? You see there's a subtle mention of the Holy Trinity, as it were. You can kind of pick it out. I'll let you try and find it there. It's right there in the first, or rather the first uh, three verses. So verses two and three in particular. And the Spirit of God moved over the waters. So the Spirit of God, so now we have two distinctions there, obviously the Spirit, third person of the Holy Trinity, and then God, of course, the Father. But now we have in verse 3, and God said. Now we have the Word emanating from the Father. So very subtly you have a Word emanating from God, and notice the comparison with St. John's Gospel and how he begins the prologue. Um, in the beginning was the Word. So he begins with that description of the second person. And that's what we have in the, the uh, verse 3 here. Uh, it's interesting, but let's, uh, let's move on. We don't want to get too hung up there. So we see that God, uh, God saw the light, that it was good, and he divided the light from the, guard, from the darkness. Notice he doesn't say he saw the darkness, that it was good. He saw the light, that it was good. The observation, that it was good, but... He doesn't observe the same about the darkness. Okay, so let's get back here to our little uh, little graph here. So day one, heaven and earth. Right now we're just doing it sort of a general view. Second day, we have the waters above and below. So we have a division. There was a division made that we see in verse 6 through 8. Let there be a firmament be made amidst the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. God made a firmament and it divided the waters that were under the firmament. Um, oh, oh, I forgot to mention uh, in day one, remember, uh, it says that God called the light day. So now we have appellation naming of the thing. And he called uh, the darkness night. And then uh, we have in the second day, he called the firmament heaven. And then the evening came and morning followed. Um, this, the second day. So there's, there's this division, but right now we're just focusing on the division here. So there's the division between the heavens and the earth, division from the waters above and below. And then we have another division from dry land and vegetation. So specifically in day one, it doesn't quite say there's a division except between the light and the darkness. So we have this division between light and darkness, but no quite no sort of directional indication there. But then in the second day, we have a division from the waters above and below. So we have a division of the waters going this way, the waters above and below on the second day. But then on the third day, we have a division this way between the dry land and the vegetation, right? So the separation of the dry land comes out. So now we have a division of the waters sideways, as it were. So first we had a division vertically and then horizontally. As it were, forming a cross, first vertically, the vision of the waters above and below on the second day, and then dry land, the water separates out and the dry land appears. This happens on the third day, so it's, it's a bit of a form of a cross, as it were, uh, in that division that's taking place. That's also the, the day, by the way, where vegetation uh, crops up on the third day. So now, but primarily there's this active division going on. 
Now let's take a look at the last three days. And we have the, this idea of uh, provision or filling. On the fourth day, remember those heavens and earth that we had? Now we have the lights in the heavens. So here we have uh, the lights uh, in the heavens are, are, um, um, are provided for. Let's get a pointer here so I can show you something. Okay. So we have the lights in the heavens um, formed. So notice we first we had the division, the, the creation of an area, or we're going to see this, uh, it's called a realm, as it were, and then we have lights in the heavens to fill that realm. Okay. On the second day, we had the creation of the waters above and below, and then we have, the on the fifth day, the provision or the filling of those waters, right? The creatures, the waters below, uh, above and below. Uh, some of the early fathers thought that this, let the, you know, this firmament is, you know, this. So, what is that firmament? What are we talking about? Is this outer space? Is it sky? Uh, some of the fathers said that it was this firmament was this uh, was essentially the the sky, you know, touching down or the, the heavens, but touching down even to the earth. So. There's a division. He says, let there be a separation from the waters uh, above and below. So uh, some of the fathers thought that the waters above meant the clouds and the waters below. Others had other ideas, you know, regarding the waters above, uh, you know, somewhere up there in the, uh, you know, in the, um, uh, you know, e ether and the avum up there. So there, that's, there was a, you know, different ideas. So, um, you can take what you will from that. There are different ideas on some of these, some of these. Okay. And then on the sixth day, we have filling the dry land, which was created on the third day. We have the land creatures and man provided for. So you can see here we have this division, this separation that takes place on the first three days, and then the provision or filling that takes place on the last three days. So uh, let's take a look here, the next slide. So let's look a little closer at day one, creation of heaven and earth. There's the creation of light. Then the observation that it was good. Again, the light was good, not the darkness. The vision of light from the darkness. You can see the themes here. Remember those seven themes, creation, observation, division show up here. Appellation or naming, naming of day, naming of night, and that is day one. Second day, the creation of the firmament amidst the waters. The division of the waters, as we mentioned, from the waters under the firmament and the waters above the firmament. So some would, the sky, right, the heavens, but that goes all the way down to, um, you know, to the to the earth, as it were, and that's where the birds are filling that region. That's where the, you know, so we had these two regions created, the waters and the, you know, the area above the waters, the sky, the air, and now you have the fish filling the waters. Uh, well, that's going to happen a little bit later, but then the birds filling the sky. And then the naming of the firmament, uh, heaven. And uh, we have to understand from this isn't necessarily paradise, it's, but, you know, the firmament heaven, the heavens, right? Because if you remember, let's go back here, you remember on that first day, God created the heavens and the earth on the first day. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, on the second day, now we have the heavens, as it were, the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the skies and, you know, the space and whatnot, as you, as you might call it. Okay, then on the third day, as we saw, there's a division of the waters from the dry land. There's that horizontal division. And then the naming of the dry land, appellation of the dry land, earth, and the waters, seas. So God names those. And then the observation by God that it was good. Um, uh, and as it says, you'll see this, this phrase repeated in the Hebrew over and over. It says, 
Vayar Elohim Kitov, Vayar Elohim Kitov, which is the Lord saw that it was good. And, uh, uh, and then when he creates man, he says, um, uh, he says, Tov Meod, which means very good. You know, so we're, God is seeing that it was good. But I want to comment on this observation. It's not simply like God notices this. He notices that it was good. But it's like he is seeing to it that it is good. God saw that it was good. He made sure that it was good. He made the thing good. So in his mind, in his sight, in God's sight, it was good. That means it is good. So uh, that's how we should take that. God saw that it was good. It's not like he is surprised by this. Some people say, wow, he sees, wow, look at that, it's good. No, that's not how it is. God is not, a, he's not uh, in wonder uh, that it, it came out good. No, he knew this was going to come out good. He saw to it that it was good. He observed, and he, in his sight, he made sure that it was uh, good. Then we have, on the third day, the creation of the green herbs and the trees. Okay. And again, the observation, Vayar Elohim Kitov, the observation that it was good. Fourth day, here's this beginning of the day of provision or filling. And uh, this is where the, we have the creation of the lights in the firmament of heaven. Let there be lights made in the firmament of heaven to divide the day and the night. Again, division, notice that, to divide the day and the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons. See the intention there? Let them be for signs and for seasons. And for days and for years. So we have intention given First, to divide the day and the night, and then let them be for signs and for seasons. And then finally he says, and to give light upon the earth, and so it was done. Now, this is, uh, in case I don't come to this point uh, uh, later, because he, he says this is the intention to give uh, light on earth, in case I don't come to this point later, uh, we're going to see that in the creation, on the, f the fourth day, because it says all these things happened on the fourth day, in the creation of the lights in the heavens on the fourth day, part of the intention, part of what God saw to, part of what God created was that it should give light to the earth. And so it was done. Now, that might seem an obvious point, but here, this, this gets to the question where people will say, well, if God made the stars on this fourth day, it should have taken millions of years, light years, millions of light years for the light to get there. But don't forget, he said that he's creating this with the intention of the light already illuminating the earth. So he created these things with the light reaching the earth. That's the intention. And so it was done, it says. That's how it was done. And then we say, the evening came and the morning followed the fourth day. So all that happened on the fourth day. The light reached the earth on the fourth day. That's how God created those stars, with the light already reaching the earth to give the signs and the seasons, to show the days and the years. Okay, so it's not a difficulty. Sometimes people will have... A difficulty, which we'll get to a little bit later here regarding the day, huh, you know, and how are we to take that term. It's not a difficulty when we understand that part of the intention that God made in creating the light was to give light, and so it was done on the fourth day. The light already reaching uh, the earth, okay? So, and then finally, there is uh, another intention to rule the day and the night, a greater light to rule the day, and a lesser light to rule the night. And we see the observation of God, Vayar Elohim Kitov, that it was good. God saw that it was good. Then we have the fifth day, creation of creatures of the water and the fowl of the air. This is happening on the, f on the fifth day. Let the waters bring forth the creeping creatures having life, and the fowl that may fly over the earth under the firmament of the heaven. And God created the great whales and every living and moving creature in which the waters which the waters brought forth according to their kinds, and every winged fowl according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Vayar Elohim Kitov. 
And he blessed them. So now we have a benediction of these creatures. He blessed them, saying, Increase and multiply. Fill the waters of the sea and let the birds be multiplied upon the earth. So simply, simply the blessing that God puts in these creature, in these creatures is simply with the intention to increase and multiply. That's it. He doesn't say anything further regarding uh, the animals. That's their blessing. It's increase and multiply. Simply that. We're going to see there's something a little bit different when he gives a blessing to man. So the blessing to man is distinct from that blessing that was given to animals. So we're not the same as the animals, as it were. So there is a distinct blessing that we are given as man. Okay, let's go to now to the sixth day. On the sixth day, we have the creation of the creatures of the earth. So on the third day, we had the creation, the separation of the dry land, the vegetation. And now on the sixth day, we have the cre creation of the creatures that will fill that dry land. And as we saw with the others, God saw that it was good. Vayar Elohim Kitov. Then we have the culmination here, the creation of man. And... There is an intention given here. I'll read it to you from verse 26. Let us make man to our image and likeness, and let him have dominion over the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the air and the beasts and the whole earth and every creeping creature that moveth upon the earth. God created man to his own image, to the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. So let's look at that intention first, and then we'll get to the blessing that God gives. So we have this intention that God created them to have his image and likeness. Now that's, uh, that, that's worth uh, noting here because... Um, Notice the two, the two uh, terms, image and likeness. Later on, after creation, uh, after Noah, after, basically after the fall, uh, it says that uh, God says that um, they were created in His image, but it doesn't say likeness. It's interesting. Uh, later on, uh, that's how it is... Uh, it is stated, uh, for God, it says, um, trying to find it now, it's a, f it's a couple of, it's Genesis 8, well, I'll take a look at it later, but anyway, it, it does say, he created, uh, man, for man is made uh, in his image, but it doesn't say likeness, however, here, it does, image and likeness. The fathers commenting on that say that this likeness is a reference to the state of grace, the original justice that Adam and Eve were created in image and likeness. Let us make man to our image and likeness. Now, who's the us that we're talking about here? Hmm. What are we talking about, this us? Who's, who is the, the us uh, involved here? So we see the image and likeness. We see the intention to have dominion. And uh, we kind of have a little bit of a problem because what, who is the us? Who is, he, who is God talking to? Uh, you know, St. Thomas talks about this. He says, uh, there's an idea out there that, well, is he saying this to the angels? No. St. Thomas says, no, that's not what it is. In fact, uh, we're going to see um, uh, in a little bit where that's just it's not really a tenable position. Um, is he saying this uh, to Adam? Well, Adam isn't made yet. So the us course, is the Trinity. Let us make man to our image and likeness. So again, we have a hint of the Trinity in the creation of Adam and Eve. Let us make man to our image and likeness. And then in verse 27, where it says, and God created, it's interesting how it goes from the plural, let us make man to our image and likeness. It's like that in the Hebrew as well, this plural connotation when God is speaking about making man. But then when the verb of created, bara, is used there in verse 27, God created man to his own image. 
the, uh, the, the uh, verb is singular. It's done by a singular. So I'm a little confused. Verse 26 says us, so there seems to be a plurality. But then the action in verse 27 is done by a singular. Is it several or is it one? Well, the answer is yes. It's three persons and one God. So we have this little hint of the Trinity coming right out of the text here in uh, verse 27. Let's look at the blessing that God uh, gives to Adam. So then we have the benediction of the man. There's an intention in this blessing to increase and multiply, fill and subdue the earth and rule it. Notice how God blesses them. And God blessed them saying, increase and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the air and all living creatures that move upon earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed upon the earth and all trees that have in themselves seed of their own kind to be your meat. And to all the beasts of the earth, to every fowl of the air, and to all that move upon the earth wherein there is life that they may have to feed upon. In that book, uh, The Documentary Hypothesis by Umberto Casuto, he makes a point of showing there's a distinction here between the type of vegetation that they, uh, that they uh, were given to eat, the seed-bearing kind, versus what will come in chapter 2 and, when, and then chapter 3 uh, after the fall. Then man must toil the earth to produce certain vegetation. So that there's a distinction that those that have seed in their own kind, seed of their own kind, um, that have in themselves seed of their own kind. In other words, they, they just generate this. They don't need help, as it were. Uh, they don't need a man to till the, till the uh, land. But we're jumping ahead a little bit into chapter 2. I just wanted to show you that, that blessing. So in not only does he have increase and multiply like the animals had, but he also has fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it. So now Adam is called uh, to rule over the earth. That's an important, uh, uh, important note there. That's not what the animals have. So in other words, man really has dominion uh, to subdue and therefore tame and, and rule over, right, govern. So in this way, Man is being likened to God in some way by having something to govern, rule, guide, bring to its perfection. In this way, God has done for us, and so He's letting us share in that work in some way over this dominion, this area which we have dominion, which is uh, the world. Uh, which is also the importance of, uh, you know, uh, ownership of private property. It gives someone dominion of some area over which to uh, govern rule, subdue, right? Okay, and then of course we see that God saw that it was tov meod, very good. God saw all the things that he had made and they were very good. So after man, the notation is that things were very good. Okay, so let's take a look at those days again. So we see those days here, uh, day one, day two, day three, Division, days of division, separating out. Day four, day five, and day six, days of provision or filling out. Well, you know that this is correcting something. So note the division or the separating is correcting the formlessness that we saw earlier. Tohu. And then we see that the filling out, the provision, is correcting the voidness. Vavohu. Tohu vavohu. So the formlessness and void that we saw, the earth was formless and void. So what does God do on days one through three? He provides a form to the place. He provides a, a shape or a realm. Okay, so now we have these different realms or shapes or areas, different realms. And then we have also the voidness where they are filled now with rulers of these realms. Remember what he said about the lights in the heavens? Let them rule, right, to rule the day, the greater light to rule the day, a lesser night to rule the night. So they're ruling in these realms which were created on their corresponding day. 
Then on the fifth day, we have the water creatures and the birds, and so they are to fill and multiply. So in a certain sense, they are sort of ruling or you know, just filling out those realms which were created here on the second day. Okay, and then on the sixth day, we have the land creatures and man, which are to fill and multiply, increase and multiply, and man indeed to rule over this realm in which he lives, which was created on the corresponding uh, third day. So we have these, uh, these, these things established now. It's, uh, it's really interesting. And you can see these different, the different themes, these seven themes that we saw before, uh, sort of uh, show up in, uh, in each of the days in certain ways. Some don't mention you know, any division. Some don't mention a particular intention. But those seven themes are there throughout those six days of creation. Okay, so now we get to the question. This is the big question, sort of the, uh, the hot question that people want to address here. huh? Let's look at day one. Now, was this a 24-hour day, or was it some undetermined period of time? So remember uh, what we saw in the Pontifical Biblical Commission. So remember back in those answers that the Pontifical Biblical Commission gave in the early 1900s when the Pontifical Biblical Commission was still part of the Magisterium and when their, their decisions were ratified by the Pope as these that we looked at last time and that the couple that we'll look at today, uh, as they were ratified by the Pope, they become part of the teaching authority of the church, and we are bound to, uh, to follow those uh, rulings of the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Until the time, I think it was in 1970, when the Pontifical Biblical Commission was separated from the Magisterium, became a consultative body and not a, uh, a ruling uh, body, an authoritative magisterial body. And so at that point, those decisions of the Pontifical Biblical Com Commission after 1970 that's where we're not bound to follow those. And I believe, if I'm, I think I'm correct in that's the year, but certainly these that we're, uh, we have looked at last time and that we'll uh, touch upon here, uh, these were indeed binding upon all, all Catholics. So let's take a look. Uh, remember what we saw from the Pontifical Biblical Commission last time, whether in the denomination and distinction of the six days which are mentioned in the first chapter of Genesis, can the word yom, the Hebrew word yom, day, be taken either in the proper sense for a natural day or in the improper sense for a certain period of time? And is it permissible to debate freely among exegetes about this kind of question? Affirmative. Okay, so there's some freedom here. Can it be taken in the proper sense for natural day or the improper sense for a certain period of time? Uh, what do we mean by certain period of time? As I mentioned before, you might say, well, in our day and age, you know, when we say our day, we don't mean this day today, uh, Feast of St. Ambrose, December 7th. Uh, no, um, that's, it, there, there's a wider term, wider meaning to that term. Uh, however, the normal normal way that that word is uh, taken is in uh, its proper sense. But we are allowed to uh, freely, as they affirmed, that we are allowed to freely um, uh, freely discuss this among exegetes, right? So people trying to, who are trying to draw uh, uh, the uh, exegesis, exegesis is drawing out the meaning, okay? Eisegesis is when you are putting in meaning. You're 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 putting you're imposing your meaning as opposed to exegesis. Exegesis you're drawing out the meaning that's there. Okay, so a lot of people engage in eisegesis, which is trying to put meaning and they're, they're reading things into it, as it were. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So now let's uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, how the the day ends, so that we can how day one ends. And let's, uh, let's, let's just take a look so that we can uh, understand this a little better. Okay, so here is the Hebrew. Vahiyerev, vahivoker, yom echad. Okay, so this is, there is evening and there is morning, one day. One day, now that is interesting. Okay, so there's the term day, yom, 
So that's why the Pontifical Biblical Commission used that term yom, Y-O-M transliterated in English. Um, and uh, that's the term yom. Uh, and that simply, it means day, okay, Genesis 1, verse 5. But the, the question is, can we take it in the, in the uh, wider sense uh, of, you know, sort of general period of time or 24 hours? Okay, they, they give some freedom. But now let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue for, okay, so uh, here because we're bringing up a point, I'm going to do some apologetics here regarding the idea that this is a 24-hour day. Uh, so, so I got my apologetics hat on to do this little apologetics on this idea that we are, you know, talking about a 24-hour day. How do, why do we know that? Well, not just because all the fathers held that, uh, although we will see that some held it in a more strict way, you know, when they talk about a symbolic interpretation. Some people think symbolic means not literal. It must exclude the historical. That's not the case. That's not how people understood it. Uh, so, for example, um, was the healing of the man born blind, was that a historical miracle? Yes, it was. You know, they know who he was. You know, he's a saint. Uh, was it symbolic? It was, too, because that was a sign, a foreshadow of baptism. The man, with the, the man born blind, born blind in sin, God uh, forming the, the mud through spitting upon the earth, and uh, putting it over his eyes and then having him wash, this is a, a sign of, um, of baptism. So is this symbolic? Yes. But was it historical? Yes. It was a historical event, but it also had symbolic meaning. Some people want to exclude the one or the other. And I think it's, it's uh, healthy to take a, a balanced approach uh, to it. Okay, so I want to focus in on this expression here, uh, one day. Okay, so this is the, the word uh, yom echad, so the, the one that's highlighted there is the Hebrew word echad, which is one day. Now, I think that is interesting because if you notice, uh, that is expressed in a, it's a cardinal term, one day. It's not an ordinal number. So the ordinal numbers as we find in the subsequent days, the subsequent days have ordinal uh, terms. So we see for the first day, it doesn't say the first day, it says one day. But then in the subsequent days, we see the second day. So now that's an ordinal number, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. But the first day doesn't say the first day. It's not used, it's not expressed in a cardinal I'm, it's not expressed in an ordinal way, it's expressed rather in a cardinal num, uh, term, one day. Why is that? I think there was specific intentionality in Moses' part because he, look at the context. He says there, and there was evening and morning one day. It seems to be that he is defining what that is, evening and morning. An alteration of evening, followed by a complete, uh, you know, morning, right? Uh, one day. He's defining here what he means by a, a, a day. And then subsequently, now he says, well, now we got the second day, the second one of those things that I just defined in the first day. Huh? Uh, but the first time he just says, yom echad, one day. So how did the church fathers take it? Uh, let's let's take a look. Let's see what St. Thomas says. So in the Summa, the first part, question 67, um, he says, now look, you, you can see where he's going with this, in the account of the first day, the distinction between day and night alone is mentioned. This distinction being brought about by the common movement of the heavens. The common movement of the heavens. So St. Thomas says that this distinction of day and night that is spoken of on the first day was brought about by the common movement of the heavens. So he's saying it's, it's something with regards to the movement of the heavens. Okay, Let's get a little more, more detail. He's not the only one we're going to look at, but let's just look what, what he has to say. Now, this is his thought here. Uh, the light was the sunlight, but formless as yet. If you remember, 
the sun was formed on the fourth day. Because people will, will bring up this objection. They'll say, well, how can you have a day if the sun wasn't formed until the fourth day? That's not lost on anyone. We, we know that. That that's, was brought up early on. But we know that God had light. We also had the heavens. And to St. Thomas, although they were, before it was filled with those stars, we had a source of light, which St. Thomas says ended up being formed into the sun, whether it's a nebula or a supernova, whatever you want to call it scientifically, you know, who knows uh, exactly what this is, but there's a source of light. There's an alternation of darkness and daytime. And, in fact, uh, he says that this is brought about because of the alternation of the hemisphere. So it is, he's talking about the rotation of the earth. That's what's causing the alternation of the day and night. Okay, so he's really taking this as a physical light, not just, you know, well, these lights must, the light must be uh, the angels, because some held that, some of the fathers held that, that when he says, let there be light, that was a reference to the angels. And that could be. Um, but here in this reference the, of the day and the night, the alternation of day and night, uh, he's taking that to be, this is really a, a statement of an actual day as we understand the term uh, in a 24-hour sense. So anyway, his thought was that the, the light was the sun's light, formless as yet, because uh, that wasn't formed until the, the form of it didn't take shape till the fourth day but already being the solar substance and possessing illuminative power in a general way to which afterwards was added the special and determinative power required to produce the determinate effects. So it's just kind of big fancy language just to say it already had the power of light as we understand it in the natural realm. Uh, he goes on further to say this, in the substance of the sun, we have the cause of light, and in the opaque nature of the earth, the cause of darkness. So there was evening, there was morning, so this light, this alternation of light and darkness. He sings the opaqueness of the earth. In one hemisphere there was light, in the other, darkness. Does it sound like he's taking the idea that, oh, this is some big long age, some indef indes you know, indeterminate period of time? No, he's not. He's not. And he is not alone. He is not alone. Uh, in this, as, uh, as we'll see. Um, St. Giles, let's see what St. Giles has to say in, in the uh, earlier than St. Thomas in the 5th century. Moses here calls day and night by his term, evening and morning. So this evening and morning, that's what Moses was using to refer to day and night. There was evening, there was morning. When the course of one day, which is of 12 hours, had passed through the succeeding evening, and the space of night had passed through the succeeding morning, which is of 12 hours, so the space of night, 12 hours, there was completed the first 24-hour day. That's St. Giles uh, in the 5th century. So if we want to ask how did the early Christians take it, this is we're, we're getting the sense of how they took it. This, they understood this as truly a 24-hour uh, period. Let's look at what uh, Father Cornelius Elapi did in his commentary. He's, he's summarizing the, what the Church Fathers uh, held. Uh, St. Augustine uh, held one thing, so this is, let's just read what uh, he wrote about this. St. Augustine wants to understand these days mystically, being of the opinion that all was created by God together on the first day, but all the Fathers of the Church teach to the contrary. When he says fathers of the church, he doesn't mean the priests in the Catholic church in his day. When he says fathers of the church, these are those ancient Christian writers and biblical commentators who put forth and held forth that God indeed created uh, these things on these six days. St. Augustine had an interesting idea. He said, and this is what uh, Father Cornelius Lapide is, re is referring to, where Augustine thought that all was created on the first day, on one day. So when people say, oh, well, these must be taken symbolically. You know what's funny is when, when the fathers took it symbolically, they took it symbolically as, yeah, creation was instantaneous, but it was revealed over six days. So it's actually more restrictive than people today, and you know, a modern idea today where they say, oh, it's symbolic, and so it must really mean six ages, these huge ages. But we're going to see how that's rather untenable based upon what was created on each day and the survivability of those things. If the other 
you know, rulers of those realms uh, had not been uh, created as it were, the winged creatures as it were. Think about this, vegetation created on the, the, the uh, third day. How are those flowers to be pollinated if the bees weren't created till the fifth day? If these mean ages, if between day three and day five, we mean really two ages, not just two 24-hour days, and these eons of time sort of thing, then how could those flowers get pollinated if the bees, the winged creatures, weren't formed till two days later? And if these are ages of time, undif you know, lengthy periods of time, you know, it's just, it's just strange. We have to start interpolating and positing all kinds of things that are just not there in science, in nature. You know, well, they were, maybe they were self-pollinating, and now you're creating, not, not science fiction, you know, so it just seems a bit, a bit strange. But no, let's get back to uh, what the fathers said, you know. It was the opinion um, that all was, uh, that the, the, all their fathers teach, contrary to St. Augustine, uh, that this is, uh, that, that uh, God created all these things on six consecutive days. And this is entirely proved by the simple and historical narrative of Moses. Note that. Simple and historical narrative of Moses. Do you remember when we looked at the Pontifical Biblical Commission uh, responses last time, where it said, you know, can we call into question the historical narrative of the creation account? And it says no. In the negative, we're not allowed to. So there, this is, there, there's, uh, there's history here. There are elements in there uh, that have symbolic meaning. You know, they have, uh, um, in addition to their, their, their sense, right, their, their, the literal sense, there is a symbolic uh, character to it, right? So, you know, the, in other words, the, we are required, as we saw, may, you know, when they said, may we question the, uh, you know, the, the um, creation of Eve from the side of Adam and that sort of thing. Uh, and they said, no, we can't question that. So that, that's a, it's a historical thing, but it also has a symbolic character because, of course, this was pointing forward. It's a rather strange mode of creation. You open the side of a man and, you know, pull something out from his very side close to his heart, and from that you form... A woman, it just seems a strange mode of creation, if not, if it were not pointing forward to the creation of the church. From the side of Christ on the cross, on another tree, not where the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden, but the tree of the cross, uh, which was near another garden where our Lord was buried, and He slept the sleep of death. Adam just fell asleep by God's power. And our Lord's side was opened as Adam's side was opened, and from that side blood and water came forth, which the fathers have all seen as a symbol of that which gives birth to the church, gives life to the church, the blood and water of the Holy Eucharist and the baptism, the sacraments that we receive uh, through the church. But note that it was unanimous among the fathers, all the fathers of the, ch of the church, uh, teach this, you know, to the contrary, that uh, that God created on six days, and especially when it's proved by the simple and historical narrative of Moses. Now, there's another aspect uh, to this that we need to consider. When we have a question here, is this a 24-hour day, or is this, uh, you know, an undetermined period of time? Um, the best interpreter of a text is going to be the text itself. The best way to know what an author means is to see what the author says elsewhere in his text. Moses is the author of the Pentateuch. So he wrote the first five books of the Bible. So he's this, we're talking about the same author now, as we saw from the Pontifical Biblical Commission last time. The same author is giving us the, the, the idea that this is one day, and there's these six days of creation, followed by a seventh day of rest by God. Well, does he write elsewhere? Does Moses elsewhere put something? Or does God elsewhere put something, give something to Moses to write that helps shed a little more light 
as to how this is to be taken. He does. Let's take a look at Exodus 20. This is a, a point that I think gets lost upon people when this discussion comes up. How does the Bible take this passage? How does the Bible interpret this passage? In fact, in Exodus 20, verse 8 and following, we have the first interpretation of this very passage. This, this passage of Genesis 1, verse 5, where it says, There is evening and morning, one day, and then the, the six subsequent days, and the day of rest of our Lord on the Sabbath. It's interpreted in, in sacred scripture. Let's take a look. So here we have from Exodus 20, uh, verse 8. And following, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Six days shalt thou labor, and thou shalt do all thy works. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work on it, nor thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy beast, nor the stranger that is within thy gates." For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and the sea, and all things that are in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and therefore uh, the Lord blessed, he rested on the seventh day, therefore he blessed it and sanctified it. Now I ask you, what kind of day is Moses and our Lord referring to in here Exodus verse 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. It's clear, and no one debates it, that he's talking about a 24-hour day, a day of the week, one of the seven days of the week. He's not talking about an indefinite period of time, and yet we are bound by the Sabbath law because in six days our Lord created. It's the same term, yom, and it's the same meaning. So in the context, he, he, he wouldn't be shifting context, uh, you know, referring to six ages, but now six actual 24-hour periods in this latter part. Especially when we figure, when we realize that uh, the Sabbath was enforced with the death penalty. God said those who violate that Sabbath will be put to death. Well, if God didn't actually create in six days and then rest on the seventh day, then how could someone be put to death for not imitating God if God didn't even do that? But if God did that, He actually worked on six 24-hour days, and then on the seventh 24-hour day, He rested, and God says, you're made in an image and likeness, and we are to follow and imitate Him. Doesn't it make sense that he, he's, re, he's really talking about a 24-hour day? Because we are required to rest on the seventh day, and we're talking about a 24-hour day. We don't say... Oh, this is my age of labor. I'm going to have another age or period of time at the end of my life. That's, that's my Sabbath. That's the seventh day I'm referring to. Like, no, you wouldn't get away with that. That's, not, that's clearly not what the text is, is saying. The other part of it, too, is remember where this is, where this is taken from. This is taken from Exodus 20, in which God is delineating the Ten Commandments. He's giving them the Ten Commandments. You know, St. Thomas, in the first part of the second part of the Summa, question 98, St. Thomas says that the Ten Commandments reflect the natural law. It, that, that's common in moral theology. This is going to be no surprise to anyone who's uh, studied any uh, sort of catechesis. It's there in the Catechism as well. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says this. The, uh, the Ten Commandments reflect reflects the natural law. Well, Let's look at that third commandment. Remember thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The natural law is that which is put there in nature and which we understand from nature itself. Where people are supposed to live, therefore it's a sin to kill a person unjustly. Our, our mouths are meant and have the capability of producing truth, therefore it is a sin to lie. It's always a sin to lie. We are made to worship on the Sabbath, the seventh day. Where is that in nature? Well, it is in nature because this is how God created nature. Six days of labor, a seventh day of rest. And so if the Ten Commandments reflect the natural law, reflect what is there in nature, doesn't it make sense that indeed this would be the thing that is reflected is how God created? 
why would we be obliged to rest on this seventh day and have six days of labor if God didn't even do that? God labored over e six eons in indefinite periods of time and then rested in some indefinite period of time. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? Uh, I think it does. Uh, again, the church doesn't bind us, but we're going, we're really, really swimming against the stream and against the church fathers and against what the Catholic Church has perennially held. Um, and uh, maybe I think it's people's uh, thought that, you know, there is, uh, there's, there's scientific evidence, you know, and there, there, there's, you know, people want to posit a, a, a long age of the earth based upon carbon dating and things like this. Um, I, I wouldn't so much set the hat on the, the geologic column, right? I certainly wouldn't set my apologetics hat on that geologic column that they have as far as billions and billions of years and whatnot and the formation of the, of the earth and whatnot because there are things that just don't make sense, you know? You go and visit the Grand Canyon, you see it from the air. It's clear that that took a massive volume of water and not deposited slowly over time because whenever something is eroded over time, which is what they're trying to posit, there's always a delta of sediment at the end of the river. And there's no delta at the end of the Colorado River. This wasn't a slow erosion process because that always produces this, this delta when there is that. And what was the Colorado River in the, in flowing through the Grand Canyon? Was that the only river that ever existed in the world? Because why isn't this, this feature in other places in the world, right? So it just doesn't make sense that, oh, no, this has been flowing for billions and billions and billions of years or whatever the idea is. Uh, I just wouldn't set my hat on that geologic uh, column. Um, there are some good resources. There's actually, uh, I'm going to show you one uh, here. Uh, this is by... Uh, Father Victor Varkovich. Now he has a uh, PhD in physics and uh, he is also a Catholic priest and he publishes this book called The Doctrines of Genesis. It's a defense of the traditional Catholic theology on origins. It's a defense of the idea of a young earth, the idea of six days of creation. Uh, I would recommend that. Uh, you might also check out this site here, which is the Colby Center for the Study of Creation, and they have a number of good sources uh, on this, uh, this issue. Uh, so, we've come to the end of that first chapter. We're going to get into some interesting stuff in Chapter 2. Uh, and I want to take any questions that uh, you may have now, and uh, this may have sparked a whole bunch, and maybe this is going to earn poor Steve Cunningham another, uh, you know, kicking off of, <laughs> we'll see what happens, but uh, hopefully not. So, um, this seems to be like the, uh, as one person put it to me just recently, this is like the third rail. People don't want to touch this one. And so now let me find uh, questions. Okay. Okay, so these are some of the questions. Thank you for submitting these, by the way. Uh, what about the angels? Are they light too? Okay, so good question. So the angels are completely immaterial. So they have intellect, they have will, but they have no bodies. Light is a body. Um, so I... Uh, part of my background, by the way, I'm, I don't think I'm just, you know, this is just a theological approach. I have an engineering background. I've been trained in the scientific method, so I understand these things. And uh, one of the things about light is it's, uh, it's a, you know, partially a wave, partially like a particle, right? It acts partly like a particle, partially like a wave. As soon as you measure it, you change it a little bit, so it's hard to tell. Is this a particle? Is this a wave? Uh, but there seems to be indication that, yes, there's matter in this, you know, in, in the light. And so they are immaterial, so the angels are immaterial. So they are not actually light. They're not actually light. It's not like they are ultraviolet light or something like that. Uh, they, um, it's just a way of expressing when, you know, when the fathers say, well, this idea of let there be light, it's a reference to the angels. That's one way it can be interpreted. Uh, and because angels are known for their intelligence, and whenever we see, like, intelligent, we see the bright, you know, the light bulb click on, right? So the light is connected with intelligence, and so that's why they use this connotation of let there be light is a reference to the angels 
Um, but certainly the fathers uh, did take, some took it as that, the reference to the angels, but indeed the fathers did take this as, yes, that may be a, that may be a secondary reference, but it is primarily a reference to phys, you know, light in the, in the universe, right? Okay, is there a connection between the Spirit of God moving over the waters and Genesis 1 in the action of the Holy Spirit? In Luke 1.35, a connection between the Spirit of God moving over the waters. Oh, Luke 1.35, I think you're referring to, if I'm not mistaken, that's when the Spirit moved him into the desert, drove him into the desert, huh? Uh, I think that's a, that's a keen insight, if that's the one to which you're referring. Or no, okay, this is the, uh, the uh, of course, the, the uh, creation of our Lord. Yes, indeed, there is. That's a very good point. So this, this is a reference, uh, Luke 1, uh, 35, is the, the passage where it says, The angel answered Our Lady, it's at the Annunciation, it says, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the, Holy, of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Right? Uh, episkiazo is the, is the Greek term that's used there. Um, it's, but, and that term is only used in the Septuagint. It's used in two places only. One, here for Our Lady. The second, at Mount Tabor. I, I should say two other places. So the other is for the Ark. So the presence of God over the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. Uh, this Greek term is used in the Septuagint. That is the Greek version of the Old Testament, Greek version of the Bible. Uh, it has use, it uses this term, this overshadow, uh, you know. So it doesn't actually go, use the same term going back to uh, to Genesis uh, one, uh, verse two, but uh, but I think that's a keen insight. So this idea of the Holy Ghost overshadowing and hovering over, it's a similar. It's although it's not the exact same word, it's a similar idea of what's happening. There is a new creation, as it were, happening. Uh, our Lord is. You know, his body is being created. He, or the second person of the Trinity always existed, but now a body is being created in the Holy Ghost overshadowing. It's, it's, a, it's a very similar uh, concept. So I'm glad you pointed that out. That's a good insight. Uh, one other thing, by the way, um, before I, the, the thought came to me here, and I don't want to lose it. Um, so remember when uh, uh, St. Uh, John, how he begins his gospel, his gospel is very much connected to the creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning was the Word. Okay, so he, he does this intentionally. He talks about the light was the light of, you know, the, the Word, the, uh, the Word was the, the, the light of men, right? The light shines in the darkness. Um, and so uh, he's making these creation images, these creation connections very deliberately. Um, in John chapter 20, verse 1, remember I mentioned about one day? If you notice, and next time you're at Holy Week, listen for the gospel or read the gospel and notice it says, Unam Sabbati. Unam Sabbati, one Sabbath. So the first day of the week. So you'll see it translated in English as on the first day of the week. But in the Latin, it's Unum Sabbati, you know, so one Sabbath. So it's a very similar to the one day of the uh, of Genesis 1 verse 5 uh, because there's like a new creation happening at the resurrection. So this Unum Sabbati in John chapter 20 is just, he's beginning to describe the resurrection. This is a new creation as it were. It's a new, there's new life. And so he uses this one day, as it were, the first day of the week. He actually doesn't say, he doesn't use the ordinal number, remember, uh, as we've mentioned before, he uses the cardinal number, unum sabbati. So uh, you'll, you'll pick up on that if you look at the Latin uh, next Holy Week. Okay. Um, okay, doesn't the fact that God created the earth first and stars and the sun last prove geocentrism? <laughs> Okay, ignoring the scientific data, this will definitely get Stephen, uh, Steve uh, Cunningham kicked off. Huh? Right. No, okay, so ignoring the scientific data to support it, i.e. access of evil, okay. Doesn't the fact that God created the earth first and stars and sun last prove geocentrism? I don't know that that does, so um, uh, that's a, it's a difficult uh, topic to weigh in on. 
Um, but I will say this though, uh, um, I don't have a problem with with uh, with heliocentrism, okay? Um, uh, just from observation, because what the problem with when the person says geocentrism, you're forgetting another doctrine. Because you say, isn't the earth the center? God made us the place of salvation, the theater of salvation. God made that as the center. And so the earth is the center of all things. But you're forgetting another doctrine, and that's hell. What you would actually posit if you're positing geocentrism is not that the earth is the center of the universe and the center of all things, but hell is in the center of the earth. So you would actually be saying hell is the center of the universe. Just something to think about, you know. Again, I'm not going to weigh on it. There's a lot of ideas out there. There's arguments for and against. Uh, I don't know all of them. Um, but I don't have a problem with the idea of heliocentrism, e even with Scripture, uh, because of another passage. And if I remember correctly, it's uh, John uh, chapter 5. Remember where our Lord says, I am the light of the world. Well, is Christ the center, or are we the center? You know, our Lord says, I am the light of the world, right? And um, he says, you know, the scriptures bear testimony uh, to me. Um, and when, uh, remember when um, Lazarus was raised from the dead, uh, he, says to the, uh, he says to the apostles, you know, um, you know, Lazarus is dead, and so he's going to go raise him, and they think our Lord is going to is going to be killed, and so our Lord says in John chapter eleven verse nine, this is interesting because he's he's pointing out to the apostles they think he's going to be killed in Judea. They don't want him to go into Judea because the Jews have threatened his life, and the apostles think he's going to die if he goes into Judea. And then our Lord says, Lazarus is dead, and I go to wake him. And then the apostles and Thomas, who always gets a bad rap, but here Thomas was brave. He said, let us go that we may die with him. And what does our Lord say? Are there not 12 hours in a day? He's talking to the 12 apostles. Are there not 12 hours of the day? If a man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of the world. But if you walk in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Are there not 12 hours in the day? And uh, so, as he says to the, uh, to the apostles, you know, he's saying, shouldn't the, he's implying to them, you follow, the 12 hours follow the light of the world. The 12 hours follow the light of the day, the daylight, right? The 12 hours track uh, the sun, as it were, you might say that. And he says, I am the light of the world. And you follow me, essentially, he's telling them. You 12 apostles, are there not 12 hours in the day? You know, you follow me, you know, so he is the light of the world. So I, it makes sense that God is the center. He's the light of the world. And of course, the type then would be the sun being the light of the world, right? Uh, that, that would make sense to me, that uh, a healer-centric idea. But I don't know, maybe I'm losing people on that, but... Uh, Anyway, it's, it's a debate. It's fine. I, li I like debate. It's fine. So, but the, again, when we talk about geocentrism, we have to remember there's that other doctrine. Hell is in the center of the, of the earth. So if you're positing geocentrism, you're actually saying, well, hell is the center of the universe. So just keep that in mind. Okay. So let's uh, take on the next... Um, the next place. Okay, next question. Who created the uh, megalithic pre-flood pre structures and when? Why are the scriptures silent about the megalithic structures, including the pyramids? Oh, okay. Well, um, so are you? if you're referring to the megalithic structures as in like the pyramids or uh, Stonehenge or that sort of thing, um, those people that were descendants of Noah, remember Noah, and seven others joined him on the ark, uh, Japheth, Shem, uh, Shem and um, uh, Ham. So they uh, descended, the people are descended from, from him. And uh, it is those people that spread out over the world, those uh, who, this, who were descendants of Shem are the Semites, that's where that comes from, 
So anti-Semitism is, you know, is actually uh, being opposed to those people who are descendants of, of Shem. But uh, so it includes more than just the Jews. However, uh, nonetheless, the, the descendants of Japheth spread out across Europe. Uh, you know, descendants of of Ham uh, went down um, uh, South Africa, Egypt, and whatnot. And um, uh, then we uh, uh, we see that those descendants built those structures later. So the pyramids and whatnot, they were, they were built uh, after the flood. Uh, in the times of the Egyptians, so um, so as far as megalithic pre pre flood structures, um, I'm not sure that we can date those to prior to the flood. I'm I'm not sure that that's there. Uh, um, you know, we have uh, we have uh, history has to be done by witnesses, and is there witness to this? You know, instead of um, you know, it's not like so. If you want to figure out what happened at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. You don't do a bunch of scientific experiments. You say, what were the witnesses' accounts? What were the eyewitness accounts there? So in the same way, uh, if you want to figure out what happened early on, you say, is, are there recordings? Are there writings? Right? And so this is where we have writings. And, and we, we will get to the, to the flood in, in a bit, so I don't want to jump too, too far ahead. But um, OK. So how much time passed between the first day and the second day? So uh, as I'm positing, because he says there was evening and morning, there was you know night and day, just as the Jews still celebrate their feasts and just like we still celebrate. In fact, we have already begun to celebrate because we've already had first Vespers of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, which is tomorrow. We celebrate first Vespers because it begins evening. There was evening and morning. And so likewise, the church still celebrates in that way. And so it was... It was just one day. It was that was the first day, and that was the was regular twenty-four hour period. And remember what Saint Thomas mentioned in the first part of the Summa, question sixty-seven, where uh, we saw that he says this was the common this this alternation of light and day was the common movement of the heavens. You know, the things were already in 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 rotation, as it were, for the earth or however that works, huh? Uh, you know, whether you're geocentrist or heliocentrist, right? Things were already in motion there, and so uh, this this alternation of the light. And dark happened in this 24-hour period. So it was the same 24-hour period as we know today. Um, there are uh, there are some. There's a couple fathers. It's, it's funny if people say, "Oh, you know, we, we want to posit a different other than 24 hours." There's one pa one father that says, "Well, I think that the days used to only be 12 hours long." I mean, I don't know where he gets that, you know. And that's not certainly not any majority opinion. But um, it's interesting when uh, when we try and posit something other than the literal, the, ten, the church fathers tended to go shorter, like Augustine saying, no, it actually creation happened on one day, but it was revealed to the angels over six days. That's what, that's what he's trying to say is in Genesis. But it seems, as Cornelius Elapidi was pointing out, they're contrary to this. Uh, the, the church fathers are contrary to this. And, um, and the fathers simply took it for granted. Everyone was in this assumption that, yeah, this is, it was a 24-hour period, and that's how they speak. That's how it is, uh, that's how it describes. And also when we consider Exodus 20, how it interprets it, I think there's good reason to hold that it is a 24-hour day. So another, no more time would have passed between the first and second day than you have in a night. Uh, so 12 hours and 12 hours, if that's what you mean. Yes, yeah, so a 12-hour day, 12-hour night, that's how the fathers saw that first day. Are there not 12 hours in the day? As our Lord said in John 11, verse 9. Okay. So, okay. Uh, there was a question, okay, wasn't Jerusalem considered the center of the universe in a geocentric model, not the center of the earth? Uh, I would qualify that a little bit because uh, Jerusalem uh, was considered uh, a microcosm of the universe, so that was meant to symbolize the universe, um, you know, and it was the place where Adam was created, the Jews hold to that, uh, so um, you could call it the center of all earthly creation, as it were, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is the place of, you know, that how rotation works, relative motion, and that sort of thing. So anyway, it's too much to weigh into, weigh into and we would probably go into too far afield and really start to get into, uh, you know, 
get into something else uh, beyond um, what's the, you know the the exegesis that we can draw out of the text. Um, remember too that um, you know as the Pontifical Biblical Commission said to us, uh, we saw last week. Um, should we expect the same sort of scientific language that you know scientific precision and that sort of thing? And he says no. We would expect the common mode of speaking. So when you know people are using common modes of speaking, that's that's how we interpret it. It doesn't mean that it's going to be um, you know exact scientific language, as it were. You know, so even like we say, will the sun rise? I mean, we're not actually making a comment on you know, actual motion, even someone who is a heliocentrist might use that term, sunrise, they're not really making a statement, a doctrinal statement on whether that sun is actually in motion around the earth or that sort of thing, but, so, okay. Uh, okay, so, did nature itself change at the fall? That is, could the flowers have been pollinated in another way before the fall, or did the fall change the workings of nature? Nature did change at the fall, that's true. But now we are getting into science fiction if we're just saying, well, there must be a different thing. There is no church father that posits that uh, the, the you know, method of pollination was different before, you know. They would say, there are fathers that say death didn't happen, you know, before the fall, uh, which uh, also kind of goes against... Uh, uh, some of those ideas. We'll have to get into that later because it's going to get into uh, it's going to get into a little too far um, afield, and we, we should give it more more time to address uh, some of those issues, the changes that happen, uh, changes in species, or you know, is the, is it viable to hold theistic evolution? We, we can get into that later because it's a longer discussion, and um, so it's possible, yes, that the, the flowers could have been pollinated in another way. That is certainly possible. But we just, there's no fathers that hold that, and there's no evidence that we have. Ev you know, again, this is, we have to base it on evidence. We do have evidence that there was harmony. God wants to restore, you know, the animals. You know, the, the lion shall lie down with the lamb. And there's harmony that God wants to restore. So it seems such harmony would have existed in the garden because why else are we trying to restore that? But it, none of that ever says anything about how uh, flowers were pollinated. But the other thing too, though, you got to figure it's not just the, if you're saying evening and morning, they always, everyone understood, that no one doubted that this is an alternation of light and darkness. So, and, the, and in fact, St. Thomas is the turning of the hemisphere. So if this is like an e ages, eons long day, the night, he already named what it was. He's called the darkness night, you know, and the evening, right? And if this is, if this is a really, really long age, then this, that's a long time for that hemisphere to be in night time, because he already defined what the night was and what one alternation of day and night was. So, I mean, those, those flowers would freeze you know, being in there for hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years before those bees could be created and then come back and pollinate them or something. I don't know. It just seems a, um, a little strange. I mean, there, there could be uh, other ways, you know, maybe the heating of the earth was different and, you know, we just don't know. So at that point, we're, we are conjecturing. So, but it's free debate. We're free to debate these things. It's good. Okay, do resurrected bodies have any attributes or abilities that pre-fallen human bodies did not have? I.e., will Adam and Eve be better off at the end of time than they were in the garden? And further, does Our Lady have something more or different after the Assumption than she did before? Okay, yes, so resurrected bodies have attributes or abilities that pre-fallen human bodies do not have. <clears throat> That, that, is, that is generally understood. So especially that attribute of agility. So agility is that ability to go through, um, or to be, go to one place to another quickly. Uh, it would seem that Adam and Eve uh, would have had to walk using their legs to get there. But our Lord had resurrected. He could you know, he'd be up in Galilee, come back down. He appears to someone at one moment, and they said, yeah, we just saw him on the road to Emmaus. So he got there pretty quickly. And uh, then also subtlety, right? Subtlety, the ability to go through walls and doors. Our Lord does that in the resurrection. It doesn't seem, there's no indication, there's no father that posits that Adam and Eve had that power before the fall. There are fathers that believe that Adam and Eve could communicate to each other simply by their thought, that they wouldn't need speech. 
I think a lot of guys would like that, you know, the guys would probably appreciate that more. But um, so, uh, and that's, that's just conjecture as to what, if they had that power or not. Uh, will Adam and Eve be better off at the end of time than they were in the garden? Uh, yes, yes, they will be. Uh, they are they are saints. Uh, the, the church holds them as, yes, that they were redeemed. You know, they, they did penance. Uh, Adam lived for 935 years uh, doing penance the rest of his life, and that was the only sin he committed. That's the tradition of the church as well. He only just committed that sin. He repented of it so hard. He's, I'm not sinning again. We're not making that mistake again. You know, he knew better. <laughs> so uh, he really repented and did a lot of penance for that. And does Our Lady have something... Uh, more or different after the Assumption than she did before. Well, yes, so she does have the beatific vision uh, after the Assumption. So on this earth, although she had the state of, she always had the state of grace, not a, uh, not a single motion of uh, concupiscence, uh, no original sin ever on her soul, after the Assumption, uh, she now enjoys the beatific vision. So she can see God in his essence as he is. So that was added to her uh, at, at uh, the completion of her earthly life. Okay. Why does an infinitely powerful God have to rest? Aha. Yeah, this is an old question. So don't think you like, aha, here's an aha question. Yeah. This, this, is, uh, this is simply the language. And in fact, the Pontifical Biblical Commission addressed this. Because are there use of what we call anthropomorphisms. Anthropomorphisms is applying human terminology, human terms to God. I'll ask you another question. Does God have to walk in a garden? Does he have legs that he has to walk in the garden? Because it says he walked in the afternoon air. These are anthropomorphisms. These are expressions that we use and apply them to God. We simply mean with regards to us, it was a cessation of activity. So it doesn't mean rest as in wow, that was tough. That's not the rest. Rest is simply cessation from activity. A ball doesn't hit sweat. A ball doesn't do labor. But you can say that ball is in motion or that ball is at rest. It simply means a cessation of activity. It doesn't mean exhaustion. So you see, we're applying, what that is, is it's acronistic. We're applying our, acronistic means applying us today, something that's a property of us today, and applying that backwards to what the meaning must have been back then. You know, so it's anachronistic to say, yeah, well, since we get tired now after the fall, are we saying that rest means that God was getting tired? No, that's anachronistic, and we simply mean the cessation of activity. With regards to us, God is always active. God is always doing. He is alive. He is always sustaining, because without His sustaining power, you would go out of existence. You know, uh, that, that's the, the reality. You know, if you, you go to sleep, you don't sit there going, I've got to stay alive, i got to stay in existence, but we go to sleep. There's no act of your will that's keeping you in you know, existence. Simply, you still exist, you know. It's God's sustaining power, right? So, uh, there we go. So, that's, that's why uh, those terms are used to our understanding, you know. God rested. Well, we really mean that, you know, God we, we stopped observable activity or activity that's observable by the human eye. That's what we're talking about. The motion that would be observable in the human sphere. That's, that's the rest that we're talking about. Okay? So, but good question. Okay, was God's original plan marriage for man and woman and union with God? Uh, I'm referencing that there is no marriage in heaven. Aha, good question. So, yes, God's original plan was that there be uh, marriage uh, for man and woman. However, he willed for them to meet and fall in love and, you know, agree to be husband and wife in celibacy. I tell this to people when, especially when you know I'm traveling or two people run into me and they they seem to have a problem with celibacy. I don't know why they have a problem with my celibacy. That's just weird, but okay, that being that what it is, I tell them, well, you know what, you're a Christian, yeah, okay. God called you to celibacy too. You're, everyone's called to celibacy. 
And everyone is. Up until you're married, you're called to be celibate. I hope no Christian doubts that. Every one of us is called to be celibate. Up until we're married. God does not command the impossible. So it's possible for everyone to maintain that celibacy up until marriage. It's, it's not a, a challenging, I mean, it's, well, I mean, okay, it's challenging, you know, but it's, it's not an uh, impossible challenge is what I mean. So, um, but God saw, you know, as we see the intentionalities we, we saw in creation here, uh, increase and multiply, right? In Genesis 1, 28, he says to Adam and Eve, increase and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So that increase and multiplying was going to happen through marriage and natural human uh, progeny and uh, in the normal way. So that is, uh, that was part of God's, God's act. Now, God is restoring the original state. So in other words, uh, Adam and Eve were created in a celibate state, and God is restoring that in heaven. That's why there's no marriage in heaven. Uh, uh, we are restoring to the very, very, very original state, although, yes, it was part of God's original plan that Adam and Eve eventually you know, have children in, in the normal way, and so, um, so there we go. Okay. So, uh, we, there's another question that is actually about a subsequent chapter, and we are out of time. So, we are going to close now with our prayer. Uh, thank you for coming. So, we will pick up uh, next time. We do these Bible studies on the first and third Wednesdays of the month, uh, 6.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And uh, we will continue on with chapter 2 of Genesis next time. So let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. I'll give you all a blessing. Benedictio de i omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, descendat super vos et maniat semper. Amen. God bless.